only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. This is late breaking news from Eyewitness News 5. Good afternoon, I'm Rachel Calderon. Texas authorities say they have found Oklahoma fugitive Tech Charles Dyer. He was found in the Houston area, was taken into custody. He is wanted in Stevens County for missing a court date. He is accused of raping a six-year-old girl. Let's go live to Houston now for the latest on this investigation and what authorities say. Brother of Keepers, my name is Sergeant Charles A. Dyer. Some of you might know me under the call sign of July 4th Patriot. I am an eight-year veteran of the United States Marine Corps in the Iraq War. I am an infantryman with dual honorable discharges and no criminal record. I have taken the oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States on several occasions. But it wasn't until after seven years of service that I actually understood what they meant. On April 19, 2009 on Lexington Green, Ma. I took the oath for the first time, knowing full well the weight of taking the oath. I swore on the very battleground that the war for independence started on that I would give my life if need be to ensure that my posterity could enjoy the freedom that God granted them and the founders of this great nation attempted to secure. I stood with hundreds of my brothers and sisters as we gave birth to a fledgling organization known as Oath Keepers. Since that day, I have had the pleasure of watching it grow. I have watched through good times and bad. Even as it has been labeled as a right-wing extremist, seditious, militia organization. Many people are bothered by these allegations, but I find a simple pride in it. Not because there is any truth to these outrageous claims, but because of keepers is seen as enough of a threat to tyranny to spend resources to counter it. Enough so that these lies have been spread on mainstream media by the SPLC and other groups, attempting to defame Oath Keepers' true intent and mission. Those who can truly call themselves an Oath Keeper, know what that intent and mission is. Those who cannot, may never know and will likely continue to attack what you stand for. You must never give up and you must continue to push forward as brothers in arms in the name of ensuring tyranny never overpowers us on our own soil. The reason for me to write this letter to Oath Keepers is threefold. I wish to tell a little about what has happened to me since I began standing up for the Constitution, to ask my brothers in arms for assistance, and to inform you all that there are things happening behind closed doors that endangers the very fabric of our society and Constitution. I have been fighting my own battles against tyranny for nearly two years now. My will to fight is as strong as ever, but my ability to continue is waning as I am now approximately $70,000 in debt. I would have to write a book to explain everything that has transpired, so I will only include the bare minimum that I can to keep the context of events. In February of 2009, I started making videos on the internet, speaking out against the corruption of our government. I was still on active duty, so I was forced to cover my face and conceal my identity. As I moved closer to the end of my contract, I became more and more outspoken. Most of my speeches and videos can be found at http colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash July 4 Patriot. By the summer of 2009 I had traveled to several states to speak about AK and our duties to defend the Constitution. I spoke regularly on a few radio shows and was also part of the documentary done by VBS.TV. By November 2009 I had caught the attention of someone that apparently saw me as a threat. Because of my current legal litigation, I am forced to be fairly vague from here. I became the target of a sting operation to trick me into unknowingly accept an illegal item in 2009. Two months later in January 2010, rape allegations were made against me by my estranged wife and I was arrested. This allowed police to enter my home to search for DNA evidence. The allegations were bogus, so no incriminating DNA evidence was found. However, they did discover a 40 mm grenade launcher in my home. This is when I learned how close to our door that the wolf of tyranny really is. By the end of that day, agents Gene Poole of the FBI had pulled me in and out of an interrogation room several times, had leaped to me about the amount of time I was facing in prison, had threatened to arrest my girlfriend on false charges if I refused to cooperate, and had made it very clear why I had actually been arrested when he laughed at me when he left the room and said, 
I guess July 4th Patria won't be making any speeches anytime soon. The FBI also seized a speech that I was working on and the mask I wore in my early videos. Neither had any bearing on the charges and both were seized without warrants. My girlfriend was detained for 8 hours a day and refused access to her daughter until Child Protective Services CPS slash DHS decided that it was okay. The next day my girlfriend was detained and threatened that she could lose her daughter if she didn't give permission to the FBI to come into the home and take the grenade launcher without a warrant. Of course, she complied out of fear. The day after that, the FBI entered my home without a warrant or permission and removed every firearm that I owned. Agent Poole then proceeded to threaten my 67-year-old mother that they would make enough charges to put her son away for 40 years if she failed to cooperate. Agent Poole came again and pulled me into the interrogation room. He told me that he spoke to his higher-up and that he could make all of this go away if I would reintegrate into the militia and complete a list of objectives over a one or two year period. I refused and he decided to make me pay for it. This brings us to the federal trial. Agent Gene Poole falsified statements on the grand jury indictment, resulting in charges being filed. I was denied bail when the U.S. attorney, Andre Caldwell, lead to a judge about a non-existent militia underground and Agent Brett Williams of the ATF lead to the judge about me possessing an illegal silencer that he had already inspected and confirmed was a toy. I spent three months in a federal detention facility and was charged with failing to register a destructive device. The U.S. attorney waited until the trial was near and then gave me a plea bargain, known in reality as a threat. I was told that if I said I was guilty, I would be home in six months. If I refused, I would spend a minimum of seven years in prison. I very disrespectfully rejected the plea and invoked my right to a speedy trial. The U.S. attorney informed me that the federal government wins over 98% of their cases and I stood no chance of winning against them. He obviously didn't feel very confident, because an inmate by the name of Eric McCusty was offered time off from his sentence if he would testify that I had confessed to him. Caldwell presented this to me, just days before the trial. All of the lies and deceit fell through an agent pool, got caught lying on the stand. I was found not guilty. After the federal trial I was charged with child sex abuse by the state of Oklahoma. During the preliminary hearing, the state also decided to recharge me with the 40 millimeters that I had been found not guilty of. I was released on a $150,000 bond and reunited with my family. Within 20 hours, Abigail Wilson of DHS was on my doorstep telling me that I wasn't allowed to be alone with children. Several times over the next five months, DHS and deputies forced their way into my home and attempted to catch me violating their orders. There was no sign of abuse with my girlfriend's daughter and I was complying with DHS. This was a problem for the DA as he needed to get my girlfriend, my leg witness, out of the state. He had DHS demand that I take a two-year sex predator class. In order to pass the class, an admission of guilt must be made to the therapist. Since I refused to admit to something I didn't do, the DA filed to have a court hearing to remove her child on the grounds that I refused the voluntary services. We spent months studying the law and showed up to the hearing with several instances of case law showing they couldn't remove her child as well as audio taped evidence that DHS falsified documents. Judge Russell of the Stevens County Courthouse denied the hearing, saying that if he had to hear our evidence, he would automatically have her daughter removed. He demanded that she sign a voluntary agreement to never allow her daughter to see me again. We protested the denial of due process and the judge cussed me. We had no choice but to agree unless she wanted to lose her daughter that day. We sent her daughter 900 miles to TN so they couldn't say she was in danger. We refused to sign paperwork and demanded due process. The judge then signed an order to steal her daughter. The sheriff's department threatened me that they would turn this into Ruby Ridge and kill me if they had to. DHS kidnapped her daughter, brought her back to Oklahoma, and held her for 28 days, refusing to allow her mother to see her until she signed an agreement to leave the state and never return with her daughter. She was escorted to the state line. Abigail Wilson then proceeded to tell me that I could never have a family again for the rest of my life, even after I am found not guilty. She stated that DHS slash CPS would follow me to any state I ever moved to and ensure I am reported as a child predator to state agencies. She informed me that DHS slash CPS operates outside of the scope of the Constitution and they have the right to circumvent a jury verdict, the law, and the Constitution if they suspect a child may come to harm in the future. 
the pretty much would allow them to take a child from any home they choose. The next step on the road to tyranny against me, other than the state openly lying in court and covering up evidence that helps prove my innocence, was when Jason Hicks, the A, attempted to revoke my bond on two reasons. The first was because I made derogatory statements about the FBI, judges, DHS, law enforcement, much like the statements in this letter. The second reason was a complete lie contrived by Jason Hicks. Paraphrasing it, Mr. Dyer and two unidentified individuals cast the courthouse. When approached by law enforcement, Mr. Dyer stated that he was looking for his lost dog. The motion then stated that I am a threat to the community because of my actions. The police officer took the stand and was questioned by the judge. He testified that yes he had seen me, I was completely alone, no officer ever approached me, and I was simply walking on the sidewalk. My attorney then informed the judge that I had an appointment to see my attorney across the street from the courthouse that day. If you think we live in a country that is not losing freedom, think again. Thankfully the judge had mercy on this poor peasant of the state because he didn't arrest me for walking on a public sidewalk. He only trampled my first First Amendment by telling me I would go to jail if I made more videos. I would be jailed for telling what they were doing to me, basically. After completing my next trial, the jury was unable to come up with a verdict and a mistrial was declared. There were two undercover male and two female FBI agents in my court proceedings and Agent Ken Western stood outside of the courthouse telling people that I was guilty. He was lying to them about the DNA evidence. We have two affidavits proving this as well as audio proof that Western knew there was no such evidence. Three days before my next trial, someone burned my house down while I was away. Before I even knew my house had burned, the FBI were investigating it. Once again they had no jurisdiction or interest in a state problem, but once again, here they were. I had a court hearing where I pleaded for a one week continuance because I'd lost everything I owned except the clothes on my back. I didn't even have a suit for trial now. I was denied and ordered to start trial at the beginning of the next business day. At this point my first, second, fourth, fifth, and eighth amendments had been trampled stripped completely. The FBI were violating jurisdiction and falsifying paperwork to arrest me. Someone had tried to burn my house down and possibly kill me. I was a suspect in the arson. I had no possessions left on the face of the planet. The state refuses to ensure I have a fair slash unbiased trial, and the court refuses a simple week continuance so I can at least get a new suit. Needless to say, I was pushed to the edge and afraid for my life. I skipped town and missed my trial date. Normally a warrant would be issued and they wait for you to turn up somewhere. This is another instance that should raise questions because a federal warrant was issued and a nation with manhunt involving 10 law enforcement divisions, including the FBI, began. Within a week, SWAT teams were busting in doors as far east as Florida and running operations in Texas. One of the FBI SWAT teams caught up with me in Texas and surrounded me in a parking lot. They came at me with rifles drawn and I know they would have no problem with killing me and making it look like I provoked them so I ran and invaded them for 5 days until the guy that burned my house down was arrested and I was able to find local law enforcement to surrender to. So now here I sit waiting for a show trial where the prosecution is allowed to hide evidence, lie and mislead a jury while I have my hands tied and I am not even allowed to introduce evidence to clear my name without it being twisted or denied altogether. The most tragic part of my story is that I'm not alone. I wish I were. This is happening to American citizens on a daily basis. If you think you can't be stomped out for speaking the truth, please look into my situation to see that you're sadly mistaken. It's crucial that the American people wake up and realize that tyranny rears its head in many forms. My life has been completely destroyed by the tyranny of injustice from our legal system and road government officials. My God-given rights have been stripped by a government that uses the color of law to do anything they wish. This letter doesn't even present half of what they have done to my family and might would take a book to bring it all to light. Charles de Montesquieu said, There is no crueler tyranny than that which is perpetuated under the shield of the law and in the name of justice. From my personal perspective I tend to agree. I'm writing this from behind bars, facing a sentence of 25, life, knowing I may never see the light of day or my family again. Coupled with the fact that law enforcement here has already been heard making statements about how they would release my case info to other inmates to see how long I can last, I'm fighting for my very life. I ask you today to stand with me and my fight. I need your help.
any help that you can render. Whether you might be able to send a dollar to my defense fund, a prayer to God above, or help make others aware of what happens behind the smoke and mirrors of our justice system, I ask you to do something, anything. Find someone else out there that needs help if you decide not to help me, but please do not stand idly by as our government continues to bring its iron fist down on the innocent people of our country to further dishonorable agendas. For those of you that don't turn a blind eye, I count you as my brother. You have my love and respect. Please never give up and never surrender. Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. Thomas Paine, Charles A. Dyer, also known as July 4th Patriot.